Happy Sabbath, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Uh, we welcome you back to the Seventh-day Adventist Church Kings, where we have been having our exchanges for the past weeks. Uh, COVID-19 has seen to it that I have an invitation into your homes, and I thank you for extending that inv into, um, invitation and the warmth of your friendship and welcome as I come in. And so today we are here to worship the Lord again in the beauty of holiness. Thank you for sticking out, out with us. Welcome, welcome. We hope that our members are enjoying good health. And uh, we hope that you will continue to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We welcome the Granville praise team with us for today. They will provide a special praise and worship for us. And they will also provide special music for us. So we welcome them and ask you to pray that God, through the ministry of music, will bless your heart as they lead us in worship. Thank you. God bless you. Oh 
The scripture reading is taken from Jonah 1, verses 1 to 7, and it reads, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amate, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and called every man unto his God, and cast forth wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was down in the side of the ship. He was laid fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call up on thy God. So be that God will think upon us that we not perish. Seven and last. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, so that we may know who caused this evil to fall amongst us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. This is the ending of this portion of God's holy word. Almighty Father, we come this morning giving you thanks and praise because you are God, you are our creator. We thank you, Lord, that you have provided for us and you have seen it fit to send your only son to die on Calvary's cross for our sins. So we come this morning, humble at your feet, asking you to forgive us of our many sins. Lord, we recognize that we have sinned before you and come short of your glory and of your honor and of your praise. So we come bowing in penitent heart this morning, asking you to forgive us and to heal our land. O oh Lord, during this time of COVID-19, the virus has been sweeping across the globe, around the world, and as we come crying for your people around the world, O oh God, we ask in you to hear our prayers from your dwelling place. Remember those who are at the front line of duty, our doctors, our nurses around the globe. We ask in you, Lord, to protect them with your hands of mercy and love. Remember those who have lost loved ones during this crisis to be with them, O oh God, and show them the way that there is hope. There is hope in King Jesus. There is hope in you, dear Lord. Give us the faith, the courage to carry on, because, Lord, you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. You have done it in time of, in the past, and you will do it again for us. When you are asleep on that boat, O oh Lord, you command the wind to stand still, and it obey. So now we come crying out to you, Lord. 
Remember those of us who are at home, the elderly, our children. We ask in you as we do social distance, O oh Lord, to be near us, to provide for us. Help us that we will never go cold, but we will study your words more. We will reflect on you more. We will pray to you more. And we will send a word to our loved ones and friends across the globe that you care for them and you're there with them. Provide for the children, dear Lord. Put food on the table. Because, Lord, we know you are a prayer here in God. We ask you, know, dear Father, to heal our land. We need healing, O oh God, and it's only you and you alone can do this. So we come with open hands this morning to be filled with your love and your mercy. Take full control, O oh Lord, of this country, Jamaica, and around the world. You see what is going on in New York, Italy, England, and other places around the world. People are dying. But we ask you, Lord, as they are lying on their beds, to give them hope that they can speak to you and you will hear from heaven. You said we should ask and it shall be given. Seek and it shall find. Knock and it will be open. So we come knocking this morning and we are waiting upon you, O oh God, because we know you will answer our prayers. So hear us, O oh God, and answer our prayers according to your will and your riches in glory as we wait upon you and we ask you these mercies in your son's precious name, we pray and say thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now it's time for the children's story. The topic of the story is Jonah and the Big Fish. At this time, another prophet named Jonah was giving the word of the Lord to the Israelites. To Jonah, the Lord spoke to him, saying, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it, for its wickedness rises up before me. But Jonah did not wish to preach to the people of Nineveh, for they were the enemies of his land, the land of Israel. He wished Nineveh to die in its sin and not to turn to God and live. So Jonah tried to go away from the city where God had sent him. He went down to Joppa and took a ship for Tarshish. 
But the Lord saw Jonah on the ship, and the Lord sent a great storm upon the sea, so that the ship seemed as though it would go to pieces. The sailors threw everything overboard, and when they could do no more, every man prayed to his God to save the ship and themselves. Jonah was lying fast asleep, and the ship's captain came to him and said, What do you mean by sleeping in such a time as this? Awake, rise up, call upon your God. Perhaps he will hear you and save our lives. But the storm continued to rage around the ship, and they said, There is some man on this ship who has brought this upon us, this trouble. Let us cast lots and find who it is. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. They said to him all at once, Tell us, who are you? From what country do you come? What is your business? To what people do you belong? Why have you brought this trouble upon us? Then Jonah told them the whole story how he came from the land of Israel and that he had fled away from the presence of the Lord. And they said to him, What shall we do to you that the storm may see? Then Jonah said, Take me up and throw me into the sea. Then the storm will cease and the waters will be calm. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. But the men were, were not willing to throw Jonah into the sea. They rowed hard as they could to bring the ship to land, but they could not. Then they cried unto the Lord and said, We pray thee, O Lord, we pray thee, let us not die for this man's life. For thou, O Lord, hast done this, done as, it, as, as he pleased. At last, when they could do nothing else and save themselves, they threw Jonah into the sea. At once the storm ceased and the waves became still. Then the men on the ship feared the Lord greatly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made a promise to serve him. And the Lord caused a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was alive within the fish for three days and three nights. In the fish, Jonah cried to the Lord, and the Lord caused the great, the great fish to throw him up upon dry land. Notice, all through this story, although Jonah was God's servant, he was always thinking about himself. God protected Jonah and saved him. Not because he was such a good man, but because he wanted to teach him a great lesson. By this time, Jonah had learned that some men who worshipped idols were kind in their hearts, and they were dear to the Lord. This was the lesson that God meant for Jonah. And now the, and now the call of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Arise, go to Nineveh that great city, and preach to it what I command you. So Jonah went down to the city of Nineveh, and as he entered into it, he called out to the people, Within four days shall Nineveh be destroyed. And he walked through the city all day, crying out only this, Within four days shall Nineveh be destroyed. And the people of Nineveh believed the word of the Lord as spoken by Jonah. They turned from their ways. They turned from their sins and fasted and sought the Lord. From the greatest of them down to the very least. The king of Nineveh arose from his throne and laid aside his royal robes and covered himself with sackcloth and ashes as a sign of his sorrow. And the king sent out a command to his people that they should fast and seek the Lord and turn from sin. And God saw that the people of Nineveh were sorry for their wickedness, and he forgave them and did not destroy their city. 
But this made Jonah very angry. He did not wish to have Nineveh spared because it was the enemy of his own land. And also, he feared that men would call him, a, call him a false prophet when his word did not come to pass. And Jonah said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I was sure that it would be thus, that thou wouldest spare the city. And for that reason, I tried to flee away. For I know that thou was, gracious, thou was a gracious God, full of pity, slow to anger, and rich in mercy. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. And Jonah went out of the city and built a little hut on the east side of it. And he sat on the roof to see whether God would keep his word that he had spoken. Then the Lord caused a plant to, with thick leaves to grow up and to shade Jonah from the sun. And Jonah was glad, and he sat under the shadow. But a worm destroyed the plant, and the next day a hot wind blew, and Jonah suffered from the heat. And again, Jonah wished that he might die. And the Lord said to Jonah, You were sorry to see the plant die, though you did not make it grow, and though it came up in the night and died in the night. So, should I have, should not have I pity on Nineveh, that great city, where are more than a hundred thousand little children, and also many cattle, helpless and knowing nothing? And Jonah learned that men and women and little children were all precious in the sight of the Lord, even though they knew not God. See you next week. Jesus, the little children, all the children of the world, never think of that one word, but a person in the sun. Jesus, the little children of the world. Jesus, the little children, all the children.
so we're talking today about God and being the God of a second chance. We, we want to start with a little pop quiz. And the answer may shock you. Which of the following should more likely obey an instruction from God? Which of the following should more likely obey an instruction from God? A prophet, the sea, a fish, or A and B, which is a prophet and the sea. In Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. That expression, the word of the Lord, is generally used in scripture to mean direct communication from God. A kind of hotline connection between God and his people. And so this hotline connection of which Jonah 1 and verse 1 speaks carries an imperative. You go to Nineveh. This amazing and instructive little book is full of spiritual insight and beauty. For me, it is one of the most noble books in the Old Testament. One cannot read this book without experiencing some of the glowing contagion of the author's dream. It is a great pity that the value and beauty of the book of Jonah has been obscured by the fish story which has stolen the spotlight. I remember in my younger days we were having a series of meetings right here in this town and I was the gift man. So I was giving out some Bibles. And I said, I have a Bible to give to the first person who can answer this question. And I said, I'd like 10 people to come up front. And this question will go to these 10 persons. And I want the first one who um, gives the right answer to be identified. So I have two ushers on either side of me. And I said, are you ready? They say, yes. I said, who swallowed jo Jonah? And a man pushed up his hand and said, the wheel. And I said, man, you need a Bible. And gave it to him. Interestingly, there are things that we have grown up believing that are not factual or verifiable. For example, if you speak to the average Bible-believing Christian, they will tell you that the whale swallowed Jonah. But do you know that the Bible does not say that? The closest the Bible has come to that is to say a great fish. Well, this book seems preoccupied not with the fish, but with the love of God. And the challenge of living in a world that is torn asunder with antagonism. The book seeks to present the universality of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. One of the first things we are told in the story is that Jonah was given a message to deliver to Nineveh. Nineveh, by the way, was the most dreaded, hated, and fearsome enemy among Israel's oppressors. Observations. One. The book is written in the third person and does not identify its author. But its inspiration and historical veracity have never been in question in the realm of theology. Two. Called in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1, the son of Amatai, Jonah came from Gathap, which was near to the place that came to be known as Nazareth. Later, it became known as Galilee. 2 Kings 14, 25. 3. Under Jeroboam, Israel prospered 
even though it was infamous for injustice to the poor, which Jonah's contemporary Amos addressed unequivocally. Four, rather than calling Jonah to preach to his own people, God is doing a radically new thing by calling Jonah. Jonah was appointed prophet to the heathen, the Assyrians, and their capital city, Nineveh, one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. Five, Jonah decided that not even God could get him to go down there. Rather than traveling northeast to answer God's call, he decided to go west to Tarshish, modern Spain. Six, from this base, Jonah would have to travel an inordinately long way. Someone estimated about 750 miles. But it was not the journey that gave Jonah his problem. It was the Ninevites that distressed him. Seven. The Ninevites were cruel to captives and undesirables. They were known for their debauchery, their idolatry, and prostitution. The place was repulsive and repugnant and offensive to Jonah's spiritual sensibilities. Number eight. The Ninevites represented a menacing threat to Israel's survival. And Jonah wanted to have nothing to do with their salvation. But in giving Jonah this novel assignment, God was breaking new frontiers by showing compassion to people outside of the seed of Abraham. Jonah would have had the distinction to be the first apostle to the Gentiles. This book seems to highlight that there is too little recognition of our common destiny. There is too convenient an assumption that we are not our brother's keeper. No matter what evil and suffering and actions are meted upon our brother, we too often regard ourselves as not related to one another. God informed Jonah that the reason he's sending him down there is that their wickedness have come up before him. They skinned men alive down there in Nineveh. They hung offenders of law and order by their tongue. Jonah, the righteous man, decided he would have nothing to do with them. In response to the assignment given him, Jonah fled, not because he was afraid or because of the hardships involved or even because personal danger uh, to himself was looming. Jonah was not concerned about the approaching danger and doom of the Ninevites. The message of doom that was given to him because of the racial conflicts between Israel and these people, Jonah made his decision. I am not going down there. What he wanted and what God wanted were mutually exclusive. He wanted to see Nineveh destroyed and the enemy of his people in it. But he was concerned that God's intervention was, would abort his desire. In other words, he says, I know God. God says he's going to destroy them. And he is sending me down there to tell them that. But I know that when I go and tell them, they may repent. And if they repent, God is going to forgive them. I am not going down there. Jonah 10, Jonah 3, sorry, 10 to 4, 2. Knowing God and his modus operandi, Jonah knew what God was thinking. All he wanted was the people to repent. And so Jonah closed that door. Some people must not come in. Says who? And if we are not careful with our self-righteousness as Christians, we will kick the door of salvation shut on certain people that we believe should not be uh, uh, privy to are experiencing the grace and forgiveness of God. As Christians, we mark off some people like gays and lesbians and 
pedophiles and murderers and fornicators and robbers and rapists and convicts and meat eaters and sabbath breakers etc 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 so jonah fled from the presence of god it was too discomforting for him his actions betray his prejudice and his hypocrisies the righteous man went to the wharf in a calculated effort to escape god's assignment he went to the pier and bought his ticket and boarded the ship went down into the ship and fell asleep the man's conscience is at best suspect the lives of a nation are in the balance and he is so fast asleep in the bottom of the ship not even the ferocity of a storm which imperiled the collective lives of the occupants of the ship could wake him my friend if you are a christian if you are a believer in god if you're a student of the word and you see all these things coming to pass and you don't have sleepless nights about the salvation of your neighbor and friend and co-workers and relatives and partners and children if you don't set up at night worrying about the salvation of those you know and love you are worse than jonah he was fast asleep as fast asleep as many people around us are that not even corona can wake them from their stupor too many people are awake to exploit opportunities for economic social and academic in advancement but completely oblivious to the incipient tempests gathering around us they know how to grasp economic opportunities and make a money they know how to pass exams but to be prepared for the coming of the lord they are completely oblivious jonah would be willing to be the agent of doom to those enemies of his people but not a messenger of redemption jonah 4 1 to 3 so jonah did what many people today are doing he ran he made an effort to avoid god but God's wind swept down from the hills of Palestine. God's storm raged across the sea. God's sea became magnificent in its fury. And inanimate object and nature became God's instrument of enforcement. Three times we are told that Jonah fled. One of the recurring themes of the book of Jonah is the dogged perseverance displayed by God. In the salvation process jonah is rebellious but god is relentless jonah is a letdown he is sleeping while the pagans are praying i say it again jonah in the story is a letdown the people's salvation is in his hand and he is sleeping while the pagans are praying what does that say to us as God's remnant people? Some of us are so fast asleep on the borders of eternity that only the fires of hell can wake us up. This chapter is unbelievable, especially in light of verse 4. There was a mighty wind on the sea and a mighty tempest arose. There are five casual pieces of information that follow the ship was about to be broken up verse 5 the mariners were afraid same verse 5 every man was calling upon his god they were indiscriminately throwing cargo overboard but jonah was fast asleep let me run that by you again because this should be a shocker five casual pieces of information the ship was about to be broken up in pieces the mariners were afraid every man was calling upon his god they were indiscriminately throwing cargo overboard 
and Jonah was fast asleep. I do it again. The ship was about to be broken up in pieces. The mariners were afraid. Every man was calling upon his God. They were a cargo ship. They were throwing cargo overboard. But Jonah was fast asleep. When the sailors on the boat discovered that this man was fast asleep down in the bottom. They were just throwing cargo out. And all of a sudden they discover that there was a man with no conscience that was down there sleeping. They did not say a thing to him. The Bible gives you the impression that the men were so chagrined. They never said a thing to him. They went and called the skipper. So the captain came to him. The ordinary sailor, sailors couldn't handle this one. This man must be a lunatic or an imbecile. He can't be an ordinary man based on all that is happening and his response. The captain comes down. Man, get up. You mean you don't have a God? Talk to your God. Because we are getting no answer from our God. This is bigger than our God. Try your God and see if he can help. Jonah Refused to speak. Not to them. Not to God. So they decided to spin the toss. And cast lots. And the lot fell on Jonah. Verse 7. In verses 8 and 9. The sailors are pleading with him. Asking for a testimony. For a witness. For a Bible study. For a sermon. For an appeal. And I feel like Jonah on the ship with these men at their wit's end. They don't know what to do. Their gods are not able to answer. With all that is happening in the world, the God of silver and the God of gold and the God of plenty and the God of position and popularity can't respond now. Somebody is asking us as Christians to call upon our God. Well, Jonah is babbling a half truth. Tell us, man, who are you? Where are you from? You know, as I read this text, I think of my co worker, Pastor Ignal Grant, and his mentor, Pastor L.C. Thomas. And Grant would tell us that when Thomas was pastoring his circuit, his church, and saw him in the town, he would call him, Ignal! Say, yes, pastor. Come here, man. He goes, and pastor will begin. Pastor, where are you going? Where is your mother? How is your father? Where are you coming from? Where were you yesterday? What wrong have you done? What occupation you want to He's not giving him any time to answer. He's just piling up questions upon questions. Here are the sailors. They don't even understand or realize the man isn't answering their question. Tell us, man, who are you? Where are you from? What is your occupation? What great wickedness have you done to your God? What is your, what, where are you from? Where are your people? Then Jonah began his babbling. I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, the Bible teaches that to fear God is demonstrated by obedience to him. The men are shocked. Why have you decided to rebel against God, man? Verse 10. In verse 11, the men ask a question that betrays their fear. This is borne out by a throwaway line. For the sea was growing more tempestuous. That throwaway line betrays the fact that the men were shocked to their wits. The men were terrified for their lives. Jonah almost stopped your heart with his audacity. Not even the humanity of those pagans could move Jonah. The men said, man, we don't know your God 
We don't know what he can do, but we have tried everything at our disposal. You try now. Talk to your God to see if he will intervene to help us. Rather than responding, Jonah is so audacious. Jonah said to the men, throw me in the sea and that will end it all. Verse 13. The men said, no, we can't do that. You might not love yourself. And you might have no regard for your God who for all intent and purposes might be impotent. But where we come from, even though we are heathens, man take care of man, man take care of one another. People don't just kill one another. So, And I am, I, I am wondering if Jamaicans have ever heard that story. When we are just killing each other in cold blood, we have, we have laws in this country that say when it's lobster season and, and when it's bird season and, 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 and cruelty to animal and that kind of, and man just a shoot man, just a kill man, just blood in the street. This, the, the pagan said, no, no, no. Where we come from, a life is precious. We can't throw you overboard. How in the world could we live with ourselves if we do that? And the men refused to throw him over there. They grabbed paddles and oars. And they would have brought the boat ashore. But God said, no way. And when you read the story, you get the impression that the men were so determined in their minds that if God did not come down with double fury, they would have taken the boat to safety. But God said, no. And he blew upon the sea. And these pagans realized that this God does joke. The pagans realized the inevitable. But before they cast Jonah overboard, they sought forgiveness. Lesson one. God forbid that we treat offenders of church rules worse than the pagans treated Jonah. God forbid that we treat offenders of church rules worse than the pagans treated Jonah. We as a church are too trigger happy. When Jonah was thrown overboard, the drama just began. And I said that we are too trigger happy. We are too quick to sever people from the church. We must be as relentless in trying to work out their salvation as God was to save Jonah. After Jonah was thrown overboard, we know nothing more of the ship and the crew because our reporter is, re is relocated. So we have no way of knowing what happened after he was thrown overboard and the sea got calm, whether the men were converted or not because our reporter is gone. But even as Christians, we profess what we do not possess. We pretend and fake and make believe so much for so long that we are lulled into a false sense of security. Two thousand years of preaching the brotherhood of man and Christians are no closer to loving one another than Jonah did the Ninevites. We are still divided into cliques and special interest groups and factions determined by money and age, and education, and complexion, and politics, and gender, and even spirituality. I find it interesting and insulting, maybe embarrassing, but sobering, that Jonah's exposure to heathen provided him a baptism of reality. He was in the process of sacrificing a whole nation on the altar of his personal and national prejudice. Suddenly, he, his encounter with the heathen sailors and the nobility of their conduct, the sheer humanity which fueled their, their disposition, they could not resist God. There are people whom Jonah hated en masse. Now these heathens giving the prophet a lesson. They are praying to their gods. They are dumping cargo. They are rowing heroically but refusing to dump the deserter overboard. Jonah's apparent conversion, and I say his apparent conversion, which led him to offer himself as a sacrifice so they could escape the wrath of God, was not meant for them. 
I said apparent conversion because it was not genuine. The New Testament uses two words to describe conversion. Strepo, to turn, and epistrepo, to turn about, which is an, a, a noun. Epistrepo implies a turning from and a turning to. Another concept akin to conversion is repentance. Repentance is a change of mind and purpose. Painful sorrow, remorse, and regret. The idea embodies a turning from sin and a turning to God. Jonah was so stubborn. He knew that the ship's dilemma was his fault. But rather than asking God's forgiveness, he preferred to die than obey God. I have insisted that the worst in us brings out the best from God. Jonah's thought was death before dishonor. But God decided his death was not going to be that easy. Two things. Jonah faced a conflict between what he wanted to do and what God decided he must do. Jonah's tradition, Jonah's culture were obstacles. He chose the easy way out. Jonah did not want to be seen as a traitor by his people. When faced with choosing to obey God, and obtaining the approbation of men, Jonah failed that test. He swapped what he could not lose for what he could not keep. The strangers loved him even though they did not know Yahweh. But as Jonah was, he refused and decided to sacrifice himself. Secondly, the people on the ship did not know Jonah's God. But they had a commitment to the brotherhood of man. They decided they were not going to ostracize him. They teach us that caring and sharing, concord and brotherhood is a part of the community of faith. Their, their, their action revamped any get-rich-quick mentality. The fight for supremacy and what one journalist, journalist called scarce benefits and spoils. These heathens show how to abort the spirit of selfishness and personal aggrandizement that seem to be in our DNA. So Jonah is thrown to the elements. Or so you think. God ain't done with him yet. While all that commotion was going on up on deck, God chartered a ride for Jonah and it wasn't going to be first class. Now you have some explaining to do. But I'm so excited that the minor details don't matter to me. I said, when we talk this Jonah story, there are complexities that baffle people and stumble people. But I am so excited about the outcome. I don't worry about those small details. For those who are distracted by the esoteric, you can ruminate on minor stuff. Of which there are plenty. One. How did this great fish know where the loading bay was to park? How did the fish know where to come and line up himself at the boat to receive Jonah? Who told this fish that? Two. How did the sailors know what point on deck to throw Jonah overboard so his fall would line up with the mouth of the fish? Now, if there's a runway and, and the ship two chains long, because there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a warship America owns that has five acres of airfield. Now, let's say that there was a two chain uh, 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 runway on, on Jonah's ship. How did the sailors know where to stand? So when they throw Jonah overboard, he would drop in the fish's mouth. So he got in the fish's stomach. If you want the esoteric, you hug up that. Number three. How did the fish know when to open its mouth to facilitate Jonah's boarding? Number four. How was space created so he could fit in the stomach of that fish? Number five. How did the fish know what destination was on Jonah's ticket? Who tell this massive fish where Jonah's destination was? Number six, based on the assumed size of the fish, 
How did it know the channel that would bring it close enough to land so Jonah could have disembarked safely and hassle-free? And at the same time, that monstrous fish would be able to turn around. When I was a boy in this town, a whale got lost and ended up in the Freeport Pier and couldn't turn around to get back out. And so they had to call in experts to help the fish to get back. How did that fish know where to go so that A, he could deposit Jonah on land hassle-free and at the same time turn around and go back about its business? You can struggle with all of those. But when I met a God who spoke to nothing and a world came into being, those don't bother me. When I met a God who spoke to darkness and light came, who formed dirt, breathed into it, and man came, the one who made a highway through the belly of the ocean to facilitate the crossing of the Israelites on their way from Egypt. When I watched that God who needed just a slingshot and a kid behind it to floor a giant, that God who made iron swim and a jackass talk, that God who put a baby into a woman's womb without a man's sperm, the obstacles to you believing the Jonah story, no sweat for me, man, small stuff. That God converts some people that I know. I am sure he can do anything. I see some wicked people come to know Jesus, get baptized, and become deacons in church. If God can change them, he can put Jonah in a fish's belly. When we get on the other side of COVID-19, and you still have a job, and food, and shelter, and family, in spite of the pundit stalking recession, and inflation, and stagflation, and depression, when we get through it, I hope you will learn the song, What a Mighty God We Serve. What a pity that this act of God is camouflaged by a, sh a fish. This is God on show, not the fish. The devil uses the fish as a distraction. But notice Jonah chapter 2 has two critical pieces of information. One is the prayer of Jonah. When trouble takes sinners, they can pray blood out of a turnip. I hear some people praying now that they believe they are going to die. It would amaze you. Jonah is in the belly of this great fish. Call him a whale if you want. Dark as a dungeon. Three days and three nights. Jonah 117. He knows he's out in the ocean. He is conscious because he reports that he was in solitary confinement for three days. But there he learned to pray. God has to shock the system and jolt and jerk and move the terra firma from under some of our feet before we recognize him. The man saw only death and destruction, Jonah did. So he repented and interceded like people I know in Florida and New York who were blinded by the almighty dollar. But now with death and destruction around them, they suddenly remember what prayer can do. Money in hand, but only God can help. No, I have not forgotten the second matter in Jonah chapter 2. In verse 10 you read, one of the most stupendous things in scripture. I said, in Jonah chapter 2 verse 10, you read one of the most stupendous things in scripture. And it says, So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The so is connecting Jonah's prayer to God's intervention. The first thing I said, you notice in the chapter, is how Jonah learned to pray. The second thing is that God spoke to the fish. Man, God even knows fish language. I say, man, God even knows fish language. Jonah does not waste time speculating what God said to the fish. For if me can fill in the blanks. By the time Jonah's eyes became accustomed to the bright light, we are into the chapter. And the word of the Lord came a second time. Visualize Jonah. He did not travel first class. And he looked it. 
but he went on the assignment without a bath and the message had such fire in it that the city was shaken to the foundation and fear come upon the people that the king led a corporate national renewal then the story takes a tragic turn and that is lesson two Jonah is king mad this indiscriminate extension of mercy compassion and forgiveness to notoriously wicked people struck Jonah's proverbial throat God was merciful to him and that's okay he deserves it because he's righteous but the corrupt Ninevites block the pipe man Jonah 4 and verse 1 Jonah refused to live he said God if you can forgive my enemies take my life has he soon forgotten what he then did for him on the ship doesn't that man realize that God falls rain upon the just and the unjust do you know his name shall be called Jesus for he saves his people from their sins even those in sin are his people Jonah's last word in the book is spewing invectives chapter 4 and verse 8 he continues remonstrating with God in verse 9 he says it is right for me to be angry and I want to die my brothers and sisters thank God Jonah did not have the last word on the subject there were 120,000 people in that city that Jonah wanted to be wiped out when pagans refused to throw him to destruction God forbid that as Christians we reflect Jonah more than God I said God forbid that as Christians we reflect Jonah more than God in our desire to see sinners die in our desire to see our enemies destroy in our desire to meet and visit wickedness upon those who are unkind to us may we reflect God more than Jonah because ultimately the book of Jonah is about an amazing God who dispenses marvelous infinite matchless grace freely and liberally thank God we who are wretched miserable blind poor naked are all included for if salvation were a thing that you need money to buy the rich would hoard it and the poor would be on total lockdown what next we see others with flaws, faults, deficits, iniquity, rebellion. When next we see that in people, let us not fail to see in them a reflection of what we would have been but for the grace of God. Our job is to extend to them the invitation, Oh, everyone who thirsts, even you who have no money, come, buy without money, or without price because Jesus paid it all amen and amen there's a light in the window, the table spread in splendor. Someone standing by the open door. I can see the crystal river, it must have been there forever. And I've never been this homesick before. I see the bright light shine. Lord, I've never been this homesick before. Well, I can see my 
a family gather Sweet faces hold familiar No one sad and feeble anymore Oh, my lonesome heart is dying I'm gonna spread my wings for flying But I've never been this homesick before I see the bright light shine It's just about home time And I can see my father standing at the door This world has been a wilderness And I'm ready for deliverance Lord, I've never been this homesick before My brothers and sisters, the story of, of Jonah is our story. We did not deserve grace, but we got it copiously. And now that God has done what only God could do for us, are we not obligated to become channels of that doing so that it can reach others? Are you like Jonah? Having experienced God's blessings and God's renewal and conversion, you now want to block the pipe because you think some people don't deserve it. How do we treat offenders of church rules? How do we treat other people and other people's children? How do we treat the poor and the destitute? How do we relate to the rich and famous? God is the same yesterday and today and forever. Let's not wait until we are in the bowels of destruction like Jonah when the way is dark and our way is uncertain that we learn to pray. Let's learn to pray and let's pray and let's be earnest about our prayer because the Lord who hears in secret will reward us open. We don't know what this time will turn out to be for us. But we know one who feeds the sparrow and we are confident that he stands by us. We know a God who is able to make bread out of stones and to rain water out of a dry rock and rain manna from above. So we are not fearful. The only way we ought to be fearful is if we have forgotten the way God has led us in the past. Some of us have come into this town. Some of us have been where we are with nothing. And look what God has done. Well, I tell you, my friends, heaven's storehouse can't run empty. You have a car now. If your parents should wake from the dead and see where some of you live and what some of you drive and what some of you wear, it would give them a shock attack. Well, God can do it again. And if COVID-19 leave us destitute, let us turn to the Lord because we know that he's able. I pray this day. That the Lord's blessings will rest copiously upon us. And that we will make a decision. That Jesus will become our all and in all. Loving Father, we pause at the end of this service to recognize we have not loved you as we ought. We have not feared you as we ought. We have not served you as we ought. We have not been what we could have been and what you have equipped us to become. But Lord, we pray for your forgiveness. We pray that you will turn our eyes upon Jesus. Give us a, a good look 
at the incandescent radiance from his face. May the things of this world grow strangely dim. May we realize that he's our all and in all. When we are down, he lifts us up. When we are sick, he makes us well. When we are hungry, he feeds us. When we are unhappy, he is the source and center of our joy. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will encircle and embrace us with those loving arms. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we go through the coming week, that you who have brought us to this day will lead on, O King Eternal. Forgive our sins again. Increase our faith. Make us to love others because you have loved us. And when on that great day, those redeemed by your grace shall sweep through the pearly gates to hear your melodious welcome, may we be able to bask in the sunshine of your love and presence. May your grace rest remain and abide with us and with our families and with our friends and acquaintances. And may as they interact with us, they take note that we have been with Jesus, not just for time, but for eternity. In the name of him who is altogether lovely, we pray, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And amen.